Should I do this so I'm in the frame? I think you're good. I think you're good. Are, you're, you're sure? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to make sure the people in the second row can see me. <laughs> so how, how do I turn on your last name? Official. Official. Okay. Let's take a look. All right. All right. Uh, so we're going to get started. Before we do, I just want to draw your attention to the whiteboard. Someone left a Dell power cord yesterday. So if you have a Dell, uh, check to make sure you have your power cord uh, because that might be yours. Was it, was it left in the downstairs room or the upstairs room? Uh, Which room? Downstairs. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, so we're going to get started with the after lunch session. So we have Randy Fischel. Uh, he's going to talk with us about the status of the DRM drivers in Solaris. So please go ahead. Why, thank you. So um, yes, I'm Randy Fischel, uh, and I guess maybe what I should just go right into is do the fine sort of stuff that corporate particularly tells me that I need to do, and uh, we'll sit there, we may want to sit here for a while, maybe I'll uh, ramble along, uh, it was a really nice lunch, uh, decent beer, so uh, while I ramble along, you can look through this sort of statement before I move on. So anyway, today uh, my general program will be as we sit here, and, and I'm going to talk all about the DRM KMS drivers in Solaris, and this is everything below the user kernel boundary. I mean everything. Uh, I don't typically go much above the kernel boundary. I can barely spell Mesa, um, but you know when the driver crashes, I can probably fix it in about five minutes. Sometimes, when my driver crashes, your driver, you're on your own. So we'll start with introduction. So who am I? Well. Sometimes it reports this on some machines. Some, on other machines it reports that. But I guess practically for everybody's sense, this is the one you really want to use. And so who I really am, um, I'm a kernel driver uh, developer for Solaris. I started at Sun Microsystems, well, in the Solaris organization, Start and Sun, 20 years ago. Prior to that, I was actually doing a, a fair amount of Solaris work on a very interesting Spark laptop. Um, yeah, where I even had to go below the driver level and drop myself into the firmware. I mostly like to tend to ignore that fact ever occurred because firmware is really a, an evil thing, even if you know it. Um, when I started going, uh, when I started at Sun, I predominantly lived in a network organization, uh, working on uh, the network stack, network framework, transports, uh, network drivers. Uh, as time evolved, I eventually moved into uh, power management. Uh, my history in the laptop, that single Spark laptop. Uh, uh, worked out pretty well. We did driver power management, uh, and I'm still the owner of Suspend and Resume in Solaris, which actually does work um, on most machines, except for when it doesn't work. Uh, and about three years ago, I moved into the graphics group because of a long and involved set of situations, which I'll eventually uh, get to. Um, desperately needed some driver help, and I had a little bit of experience in that. So why is that? Well, let's start with the history of uh, KMS drivers in Solaris. Well, you know, in the beginning, all graphic drivers were in the kernel. But they were really simple drivers. They were really frame buffers, simple 2D frame buffers, and their entire purpose in life was to expose their frame buffer. Sources were easy, simply managed. They lived in one line, but that was a long time ago. Let's jump up a little bit. In 2006, uh, Solaris moved into the uh, DRM space and trying to get a lot of uh, x86 drivers working. And, and this was in the height of the Open Solaris time. Um, in, in Open Solaris, uh, drivers for anything was really important. Uh, mostly, we created a team in China that generated drivers, and they generated all sorts of drivers. Most of them were x86. Some of them were Spark. They were not only frame buffer drivers, but they're network drivers, USB drivers, Wi-Fi drivers. You know, all at the low level, by mostly written by a bunch of folks in China. Uh, one of the things that I mostly remember about these drivers is most of them were cut and paste. So you'd, uh, the, this, every driver would always have the same bug. Uh, for in the DRM KMA space, the, the very first driver that we did in this space wound up being the i915 driver. Uh, the unfortunate problem that we have with it, that also was, uh, from my viewpoint a long time ago, we don't know where the source actually really was based from. Uh, it, it's not obvious to me whether somebody actually took the public source and, and tweaked it or just wrote a whole new driver based on what this drive, that driver used to look like. 
so along the way, we basically have DRM working with only two drivers, the i915 driver, and, and shortly thereafter, uh, when we started moving toward Xorg, we had the Spark driver that uh, needed help in, in what's because we're still in the workspace uh, market, which was EFB, and that was for older Radeon-based drivers, um, and it, like you say, it was supported to move the, uh, in the, the Solaris moved Xorg, and basically that's about it, though we do have a little bit of work, and it's a stalled work to get support newer Radeon hardware. Unfortunately, by 2010, uh, Solaris DOS desktop is well in decline. This was actually before Oracle acquired Solaris. Uh, we really started tossing our desktop. We were focusing more on uh, the servers. Uh, the, the business direction basically said, you know, it should really work on servers. Who needs any stinking laptops? If you want a laptop, go buy an Apple, a Windows, even Linux. Uh, and, you know, certainly the Linux community uh, had a whole lot more uh, motivation and, and um, momentum to do this stuff than Solaris and is, is both Sun and Oracle was not really making money on that. It sort of went into decline. After Oracle acquired Solaris, the uh, desktop pretty much went to the developer. Uh, they probably would have killed it, but then it becomes the, well, how are the developers going to write this code? Uh, as Intel um, laptops and desktops were relatively cheap for Oracle, they decided, well, we'll keep most of it around for that. And, and there are some exceptions. Uh, interestingly enough, there are graphics drivers in some of our servers, and some of these servers users particularly believe they should put monitors to them. And certainly in a lot of places they say, uh, you know, on our servers you should be able to run Windows, specifically run Windows, not a windowing system. Um, so the support for that actually wound up being for a small set of strategic hardware and for any hardware that was in these servers. And certainly by 2011, most of that China team was either reassigned to something else or released. Uh, the, network, the network stack is still pretty important to Solaris, so some of these, uh, these driver engineers are still working on networking, but to get support for a Wi-Fi driver bug fix ain't ever gonna happen. So, in that 2011, the uh, i915 and DRM development moved into Santa Clara, into our organization. The entire X server organization was responsible not only for the X server, but all of the drivers that were supposed to run on it. Uh, and I actually joined into this group in early 2012 because we were now getting uh, a driver that mostly came from Intel into Solaris, into an individual that particularly wasn't very kernel savvy. Uh, can you help, uh, you know, can I help work on, on doing this stuff? And so I, I stepped into the group. Uh, most of the source primarily came from Intel, and the Solaris team was predominantly relegated to testing it, bug fixing it, and certainly, as I've told some folks, doing the process, which could potentially be much longer than doing the testing, bug fixing, possibly even writing the code. But by uh, mid-2013, the process was actually really pretty optimized, I and mean, we can actually spin a new rev of this driver in three months. And it, not that it took three months to do it, we just sort of chose that we're gonna take a three-month window of time, spend the last four weeks of it, and slam out a driver. And we got to a point where the driver's very good, very stable, supports the Haswell stuff, and I'm certainly happy and proud to present that this laptop itself is running that driver. Um, Life is wonderful, we're really good, and things are going great. Intel decided, we're not going to give you that driver anymore. Go get it from the community. Uh, the unfortunate problem with that is uh, neither myself or my other colleague that are working on this driver really knew anything about the Intel hardware. Uh, we've never really stared at the community code, code, only the stuff that certainly has come from us through Intel. You know, great, what are we going to do next? So the first thing, so part of this migration wound up uh, going from the base driver that we had before into the community driver. Uh, the primary thought that I had is we have to get this driver specifically out of the core operating system into the X group of base that we distribute. Pre predominantly because then the driver is closer to the counterparts that's actually wanting to use it. Uh, certainly in Solaris, if you're not wanting to use X, you don't really care whether you have a frame buffer driver or not. Any other ways that you're uh, accessing the hardware, the, the console, um, you just don't need a frame buffer. Uh, 
the other kind of uh, important thing to me was this organization understood graphics a lot better. Uh, some of my favorite stories, every time we tried to integrate code, uh, somebody somewhere would particularly ask me, did you test this on Spark? Yes, I'm going to test an i915 driver on a Spark machine. You find me one that's got it, and I'll test it. Um, and the other part of it is Oracle basically shut down OpenSolaris. We closed the source again. And this is coming from the outside. The, the, the best way that I'm going to be able to actually share the work that I'm doing is putting some place that we actually share. And we share our X source. So by early 2015, all of, the, all of the DRM drivers were then moved into the X consolidation. And by April, this, this small team of us, this whole whopping two of us, started to uh, work on the community source port. So let's talk about the status of the current driver or the, the drivers. Now you say the current, the current driver is uh, fully supported up to Haswell processors. And, and uh, I have a Sandy Bridge here that's working great. Uh, Alan has a fine Arendelle that's sort of working fine. I've got a Haswell, in my mach in, uh, Haswell test machine in my office that's running a 1920, uh, 1280, 1912, whatever, 1200 monitor, and a 4K monitor at 3600. And I toss just about everything at it. And it happily runs, except for when Solaris itself crashes. Um, most of our users are particularly really good, but it stops at Haswell. And nowadays, Haswell machines are hard to come by, and Broadwell are very strong. So the current porting work, as, we, as I stated, started uh, in an April snapshot. And for the most part, we wanted to make sure that the snap snapshot was stable. We didn't want to track anything until we got to a point of a stable driver. So we, we, we chose a snapshot, and this is the foundation of stuff. Our primary goal, of course, is to make it work. If it doesn't work, it has no usefulness, and you know, do whatever is necessary and possible to make this sort of work. But a secondary goal is I really would like to share some aspect of the work that we do back. Not obvious to me how much I'm going to be able to share back, not from what I can give out, but what the community may wish to have. But the entire goal is that it's all shareable. Uh, and so, so the structure was all based on the way the community source was. Uh, all, of the, all the same files, all the same function calls as much as possible, and tweak it where it needs to be sort of solaricized. There were some interesting discoveries along the way. The first discovery, and why I say I don't know where this original source base came back, when I started looking at the source we had from the community source, there really wasn't much of a, a match. There wasn't an alignment, even though we supposedly have code all the way to Haswell. It, it didn't look the same as what it should be. And the other thing you found out is that our DRM, DRM driver only had the things necessary to make i915 work, which probably leads to some of uh, the, dis the issues that Jay has working on the Radeon driver. The not so interesting or not so unexpected discoveries wind up being, yes, there's a lot of Linux-centric code in it. And so uh, a fair amount of the stuff that we have to go, we, we have to work with is getting translating the calls that go to the Linux code into making the appropriate Solaris calls. But we actually have a fully working driver to, to use as a reference, uh, which, which actually is great. And, and so anywhere that it made particular, particular uh, calls into Linux, we can uh, work that out. And it really made it quite easy to get to the point of what are the proper translations in it. So as of September, DRM is pretty much mostly ported. Uh, the, the driver loads, though, as I've mostly told folks, is that a loading driver basically only means that the entry points are good and there are no unreferenced symbols. There's still a fair amount of cleanup to be done, because in the course of the porting, we've made some uh, decisions what we're going to work on and what we're not going to work on, and, and you know, some basically so some stuff that would have to be deferred in some way, shape, or form. Pieces that had bigger components that would require translation layers was deferred to be done all at once rather than piecemeal. Um, and there's a fair amount of Solaris-centric code in here. But what we've mostly done is contain it in wrappers. So we've added about a half a dozen files into this driver set that describes the entire Solaris interaction with the driver. Um, and then there's a handful of files in that structure that just really aren't feasible of porting. Uh, you know, for example, DRM driv. There's just no way that these two files are ever going to look the same. So we, we sort of have our own. 
uh, and you know, very Solaris centric, but it sort of works. And then there's a fair amount of unimplemented components. Even though Solaris does support scatter gather, I haven't wrapped my head around how we translate between the scatter gather, gather in the driver into the way Solaris wants to see it. And as the previous driver didn't do scatter gather, we basically decided that's a good baseline. We can do that work later. As far as I-915, it's mostly complete. And it compiles clean, and I don't recall whether there was a line in the other one. Both the DRM and the I-915 driver compile clean, no errors, no warnings. Uh, so we've actually extracted all the warnings out of that. And along the way, there's some, been some interesting discoveries and probably will be the first set of code that I contribute back to the community is yeah, there, there's some things in here that are just a little bit out of whack that, uh, you know, sort of like Martin's uh, braces thing. If I, I, I'm guessing that if you looked at the warning, it said statement not reached. <laughs> and if you'd have looked at that warning, it would have said, gee, duh. Uh, one of the ones that I mostly remember in, in, the, in the code is I got the same warning, statement not reached, and I actually grabbed Al and he was staring at it and scratching my head. Then he noticed there's a second semicolon at the end of the line. <laughs> You know, at, at the end of a return, you know, some function, semicolon, semicolon, and, and a part of the thing, statement not reached, the next one was the closing brace. Where is the statement not reached? That second semicolon. But, you know, so, so the 9915 has taken a little bit longer. It is a much larger driver, and it's a little bit more complex than DRM. Um, and it, from its perspective right now, there's still lots of cleanup to be done. But we're actually transitioning now into the phase of, of actual debugging. Um, and, you know, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll have a fully functioning current supported hardware driver based on this source tree. Some of the challenges with this, and it might not particularly be very obvious, but memory allocation. Uh, Linux does their memory allocation and Solaris does memory allocation. For the most part, they do pretty much the same allocation. They just do it different ways. One of the most notable ones that I've talked about is the Solaris K-free, or K-mem-free, takes two arguments. Not only the pointer that you're freeing, but the size of the pointer. And this was mostly done to, for uh, Solaris memory optimization. If you tell it how big the pointer is that you're freeing, then uh, the free routine can optimize how quickly it gets back to a cache. And the other interesting thing is Solaris DMA predominantly deals with handles and properties on the handle. So you don't allocate buffers that will have different properties. You allocate a handle and then you can change the properties of that. So there, there's a big translation layer in, in how D, uh, Solaris and, and Linux handle the DMA. And then there's a, a couple of features along in there that sort of have conflicting, the uh, conflicting equivalents. The prominent one to me is Mutex Center. Linux has a Mutex Center, Solaris has precisely a Mutex Center with completely different sizes of arguments. So it becomes the, you know, how do, you, how do you deal with these two function calls that are identical that have different sets of arguments? Uh, another interesting uh, uh, bit of challenge was dealing with struct device. Uh, Solaris has its version of struct device, but it is not device. So you have to, have to extract all those things that, that directly go to Linux into a Solaris fashion. And then there's turning some of the non-obvious features. You know, the, the kmalloc is an easy one. That's you're doing an allocator. But there's, there's a handful of functions out there that have some sort of a name, and it's not obvious what this function does. Uh, and it, from what I do in Oracle, it's really gray areas finding out how this, or what this function is supposed to do so, so I can implement a Solaris equivalent. And uh, there was a handful of compiler-specific features. Uh, Solaris. Solaris builds using the uh, Studio compiler, and so this driver really needs to build with the Studio compiler because it's not really a good idea to build kernel components from different compilers. Uh, we can run GCC against it and do sort of uh, preliminary testing, but in the end, this driver needs to work with, with the Studio compiler, and so it's, it's taking the, the um, GCC-specific extensions and figuring out what the Solaris ones, and when you can't do that, quite literally ripping the code apart so you can perform the correct uh, answer. So future work, yeah, pretty much it's doing what we're doing. Continue to do what we're doing now. Hopefully uh, migrate from the April snapshot to a current release. I'll, I'll choose some nice fine base to take another snapshot. 
Um, at some point in the future, I'm hoping that, that this nice, fine, big gun can follow the moving target, but right now I'd much rather keep targets stationary for a little while. Um, need to fix and update some of those deferred components, and uh, along the way in the course of some of the stuff that I've been going through, I've actually thought that there might be better ways to do that than the way that the previous driver did it. Uh, and, you know, again, I'm hoping to contribute back as much as feasible uh, or realistic um, to, to the community. Uh, you know, we'll ask, I'll contribute, I'll either be allowed or not allowed, we'll see how that goes. Uh, do it in pieces so at least the whole block doesn't get dis, uh, disallowed. So, the ne the, the, basically the last question is how can we actually work better? Yes, the slide was intentionally left blank. I, I wrote a number of slides in here. I deleted a number of slides. I wrote a lot of comments. And, and the, end, the real end result really winds up being that need cooperation. Uh, Solaris has been out of this space pretty much forever. Uh, even, even back when the China team got into it, they really didn't engage the community. Um, I've only been in it for, you know, you know, quite literally, seriously in it for a year. We haven't engaged the community. So part of this winds up being, uh, yes, I'd like to contribute stuff back. I'd like to get some help. But I know it's going to take some time. I know it's going to take some cooperation. And I'm going to have to ask little bits at a time. And you know, quite fundamentally, I'm not asking the community to do the work. I'm willing to do the work, at least for now, until I get riffed or reassigned. Um, so, and henceforth, why the little bits at a time that make sense are good. But I'm, I'm hoping the rest of the community will actually sort of work with us and decide that, okay, the pieces that you are giving are good, but you know, the ones over here maybe not. Uh, and so we can get to a nice endpoint so where everybody benefits. So any questions? Nice and quick. It's a nice question. Um, the Solaris kernel long ago and far away started by the sort of smashing together of BSD and System 5. That's gone. Um, so when you had to get rid of Linux-isms, how have the BSD folks dealt with those things? I, I'm, I'm predominantly guessing the same way, um, wrappers. Yeah, so we're, we're not really getting rid of them. A lot of, a lot of the stuff that I've done, I've left the calls in there, and I've written my equivalent functions. So this entire driver still has kmalloc, kzalloc, kzalloc, kfree. Uh, we don't change any of those lines. I've actually re rewritten an allocator that will translate between the driver ways of uh, allocating memory into the Solaris way of doing memory. Um, it, it's a little bit overweight, but some of the allocations can go quickly and fast anyway. The, the less regular, more complex ones, or the more complex allocations are less regular, so a little bit of extra time in doing the allocations is not a big deal. For example, DMA. D DMA memory isn't, well, at least I hope, isn't predominantly allocated and freed all the time. You, you tend to allocate it and reuse it. Uh, kernel memory can go fairly fast because the, 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 uh, the Solaris KMM alloc pretty much is identical to this, the Linux KMM alloc. Uh, and the, the only relevance is trying to get the extra size of the buffer in for the K free. So, so like I say, it, it's predominantly around wrappers. Or in, in a lot of, there's actually a lot of cases where it, the, the function does the same thing, but it's named differently. So all I need to do is pound define one to the other, and it works. So I'd like to ask the BSD people, what have you had to do to live with Linuxisms in the code base? Right. I think Francois comes up in two, uh, yeah, two, two ones. Yeah, actually, that was more or less the subject of the talk I gave last year at XDC Bordeaux. Um, there were very mm, different things we had to change. Um, well, but it's, it's not so bad if you look at the bigger picture. Um, memory allocation is done with different functions, but, uh, well, in our case, in Dragonfly, we use kmalloc, kfree but it take different arguments than on Linux. Um, for that, I just wrote a macro wrapper. 
Um, there are other cases where things are a bit more difficult. Um, Metexes and so on. Well, it's funny, um, we have the same names for spin locks. Most of the spin lock functions start with spin lock something or spin unlock something in Dragonfly. Uh, Metexes, we use something called locked managers. Um, there's a lock manager function taking different arguments. If you want to lock something or unlock something, well, I just created a macro uh, with a C preprocessor, and um, now I have an implementation of metax lock, metax unlock. Well, it depends on the cases. Uh, it's really hard to remember everything uh, like that, but uh, the best solution is to run a diff at the code source, uh, compare the Linux trees and the Dragonfly trees and uh, see what differences there are. Um, in some cases, we had to rename variables. Um, the i915 driver likes to use pipe uh, as a variable name or as a structure name. I don't remember exactly which. And it's used for something else in the Dragonfly kernel. So I just renamed them uh, to i915 pipe. So, so one, of so the, one of the common things that BSD and Solaris has is that the Linux driver actually uses a list implementation that is totally different both from, from the OS list implementation. So we basically have our own list implementation. The sucky thing is, is that you have to include files as part of the driver that's going to use the Solaris list. And so it becomes now really interesting at making sure that you orient these list inclusions in the right order or else all of a sudden you're trying to get a, a Solaris component trying to use the Linux list version. And, and yeah, that's a big BSD yeah. one. Um, I, and I think we solved it both in the same way. You know, where does it belong? Well, the Linux list functions are interesting. Yeah, we also have more or less the same list thing in BSD. Uh, but we ended up uh, implementing a separate set of uh, headers and uh, C files to re-implement the Linux uh, list functions. Yeah. So there are many, yes. many different cases. And uh, it would it be interesting to study them in detail. But the only realistic way to do that is to compare the Linux and uh, Dragonfly i915 drivers yeah. line by line. My, my observation in the last several months is that, that the BSD and Solaris folks have basically approached this the same way. Uh, I think in the past, uh, the BSD folks did what the previous teams did. Let's see if we can take the source and, and port it. Long-term maintainability, that's just not going to happen. Uh, the, the Solaris team is never going to be experts in these hardware drivers. So what we really want is uh, a way that we can pull in these drivers mostly unmodified and, and only modify it where, they make, where it makes sense. So, so that becomes wrappers on the outside. Um, and, and certainly a lot of the work uh, that I'm doing now has been looked at at other teams in Solaris because they've got similar issues with other drivers that come from the Linux side. So if we, in, in all of these, if we can create a really nice wrapper, the rest of the stuff ports quickly. Or and, you can and, do it that way. And, and I assume an, an OS abstraction layer within the DRM drivers is it would. just not palatable to the... Um, to the development flow there. The, the, an, an OS abstraction layer would be awesome, but uh, what I basically hear is that, that it was done before, but because the folks who, who mostly want the abstraction haven't been participating. Sure. Uh, and, you know, I, like I say, I get that. Uh, so it, maybe it's something that we try to work into it, but for now it becomes that we have to create a Linux abstraction layer. Cool. I'll warn you in advance, you don't know me. Mark says I'm very rude, so if this comes off as rude, I apologize yeah, well, in I've been advance. called a lot of things too, but Okay, uh, no, it doesn't bother me. Um, who are your customers that want i915 and Solaris? I described that, the internal developers. Uh, 
that's it? Pretty much. But we, yeah, every so often, I actually get an external customer that cares. Um, predominantly the customers that use that level of hardware are people who are developing. And, and you don't really, you don't walk up to the, uh, the, the server, you know, plug in a monitor and, and, and sort of work with it. You have to do it on these laptops. Uh, you can do a lot of the work in the laptop with, you know, with an SSH session. Any one of these uh, is an SSH session. But there are some folks that particularly say it's native. Like, uh, you know, the nice thing about uh, having a desktop that runs Solaris is that I can build it all there. Uh, so I don't have to log into a server or somewhere, a build machine, and build it there. I can build it locally. So wherever this goes, you know, I'm up in my hotel room, Wi-Fi is not working, I can still build and test. So there, there's a lot for the developer. The sales folks who are trying to sell Solaris, you know, they want to show it. You know, they, they want to do this. They're, like I say, this is running on Solaris. It's pretty cool for the salesman. You know, it, it does work and it's sort of stable and, and great and all this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, you're right. That's. You don't think of people having like client PCs and running Solaris. Dude, what? You don't think of people having like client PC and running Solaris. Yeah. So mostly that, they can run the dumb frame buffer cards and it's good enough on their servers. And you, you do not. 3D support on this driver is mostly uninteresting. It's so, just a lot of work for supporting developers. It seems to me. It, it's, it, uh, my, my opinion is right now it's a lot of work. If, if I do my job right now, future support should be fairly straightforward. We can actually sort of use the tools, uh, the, 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 the various tools that will take the existing source and try to lay, lay translations on it that can turn it into a new driver. So, so if I, I could, in theory, use uh, Code whatever, um, the tool that Alan and, and Dan pointed to me uh, yesterday. So, Cochinelle. So we used to, I mean, the, the DRM drivers used to live out of the tree, and they yeah. used to have all these wrappers and things yeah. so that they would build on anything four different BSDs yeah. and Linux and all this stuff. And for the vast majority of the developers, which was people working on Linux, it was hell. Because yep. it meant you had to make sure that you weren't breaking things on this thing that you didn't have, that you didn't have and that you didn't want. So, I mean, yep. saying that it is less work if other changes are made is maybe a little bit disingenuous because it's just moves where the work happens, right? I mean, there has to be a certain amount of work to make this happen. Okay. And I don't think that the people who are trying to support Linux and who are trying to, you know, do all this stuff on there are going to be that interested in making more work for themselves. Because if you talk right. to them, they already have way too damn much work. And <laughs> I, I would, so I'd agree with that yeah. because certainly inside of the Solaris organization, you see the same stuff. Um, as I mentioned, I used to work in power management. Um, the, well, actually, I still do. It's a sort of a little smaller cycle of my time now. Uh, power management on servers are very un uninteresting. In fact, server customers don't want their machines to power manage. You don't want things to go off. Even, even if it's very trivial, you just don't do it. So what, you, what I tend to find even amongst the, the uh, Solaris engineers, I don't want to put something into my thing that might cause my device to go off. You know, it, and, and it's, it, it's the kind of thing, uh, is like I said the other day, is, is I also don't want to have to stand in line in security for the airport here today, but it's, a, you know, it's what I have to do. So it, you know, similarly to this community, to the Solaris community itself, I do what I have to do. Uh, and I try to accommodate as much as I can, and it's at the point where I can no longer accommodate it, I say, this is where we stop. And, and, and yes, okay, so we might, have, we might have a lot more port, but certainly, as you point out, our customer base isn't as big. So, you know, put the pain there, possibly. Um, you know, contribute some stuff back that at least is reasonable. You know, certainly if I find bugs in the core co code, it's sort of my responsibility to give them back. Uh, if there was an abstraction that, that I basically say, well, this would really help Solaris, and you look at Linux, it may, you know, this only adds me work, yeah, okay, great, that one's not going to happen. Or may not happen, who knows? You know, maybe if I convince somebody down the line and they say, well, gee, you're, you're doing good, you're growing the stuff, we'll take that fix. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it becomes, we'll see what time tells there. Uh, it, in the, it, the, the current time, we're interested and in, in we're hot to make this stuff happen. Um, Randy, if I could follow up with a question for Ian. Oh. <laughs> yes. So how much of, of that uh, concern 
with the, the wrappers just adding work goes away if you've got uh, continuous integration builds on all of the platforms that so that the Linux developers don't actually have to worry they'll get informed if the CI builds fail. Yeah, some, some part of that. that but, yeah. yeah, that might help some of it. I mean, the other problem, I, I've tried to, I, I'm kind of the opposite of him. I've tried to stay out of the kernel as much as possible. Um, so, so folks like Eric may remember better how miserable those those days were. But it seems like, yeah. Well, it it, it seems like. Yeah, and it seemed like the problem was that every time you wanted to add a new feature, you had to figure out, oh, great, how the hell do I add this on yeah, FreeBSD and NetBSD and, oh, so that's, uh, you know, whatever. To, to a certain extent, was, that's not necessarily, if, 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 there was an, if there was a generic abstraction, one of the one I, I typically like a lot is the ops vectors. So, you know, put forth a set of functions, and, you know, if you want to run on Solaris, you need to, you need to create that function. If it's not there, you know, sorry, we, we, don't, we don't suggest that it works, so I'm the one that has to make that work, and if you, change an, if you change the API in Linux, it probably doesn't impact me if I change it in Solaris, it probably doesn't impact, probably. You know, changing code, there is no guarantee anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure everybody who's done it in any length of time knows that. This isn't so much a question, but just to speak to the bit about, um, seems like a lot of work to support developers only. Um, yeah. RHEL's workstation market, though it pays for itself, isn't that big? We sink a lot of engineering effort into doing that, and we're mostly not doing it for RHEL customers. We're doing it because the, the baseline support has to be there, and because we have to be, because as part of our mission, we're going out and building things ahead of our customers and making that something that you can consume. But if the question is, do you want 3D? Yeah, most of our developers, even outside the company, aren't using the DRM because they like 3D applications. That's not why you're buying RHEL, and it's not why you're buying Solaris. So to say like, oh yeah, this seems like a lot of effort in order to make Solaris palatable to a market that's not necessarily a big part of their business, yeah, so, uh-huh. Sometimes you do things because they need doing. So in that sense, like, and, and all, all we you gotta is, do it. And all we need is one big customer, a big customer mm -hmm. to complain, and you know, I'll get five bodies. <laughs> Yeah, that for for me a lot of the time that big customer is my CEO. Yeah. Oh yeah, you've got this laptop and it's got to run Linux and I have to be able to take it yeah. to presentations. I, I should point out how much cool. grief I've been getting lately because laptops that are available to Oracle employ, Oracle employees run Broadwell and this is the Broadwell support. We don't mm -hmm. have it there yet. Hmm? Oopsie. Yep. I was wondering if um you see many of the other DRM drivers coming under the same thing where you're kind of sticking to Intel and uh, It ready. would be nice, and I, and I think that that's also a lofty goal. Uh, a fair amount of that, if, if the wrappers and DRM are right, then that in theory means the rest of the stuff is, is easier to come by. And certainly a, a i915 and DRM that are clean, you have examples in the other drivers to how to make them clean. So, so the, the theory is yes. Uh, the practical reality is, is the only corporate will tell me what we need. <laughs> I can walk under these, underneath that. You Does know that? Um, KDE or GNOME run on top of this? Or? Yes. Well, this one is GNOME. Okay. This desktop is GNOME. Because that means there's a lot more than just... Uh, and KDE will run there, too. That's, that's at a much higher layer. <laughs> but there's a lot that, of... That's above Alan. That's, you know, I'd say ask the guy in front of you, but he won't okay. answer either. <laughs> okay. It's just it seems like there's a lot of infrastructure needed for GNOME, too, on a non-Linux world. Well, that part of that reason also is the one that I said, you know, the China team. Um, the desktop is uninteresting. It's working now. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do it. I was going to pull the plug, see how long it stood there. <laughs>